Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to Liberty Global's Full Year 2023 Results and Strategic Update Investor Call. This call and the associated webcast are the property of Liberty Global, and any redistribution, retransmission, or rebroadcast of this call or webcast in any form without the express written consent of Liberty Global is strictly prohibited. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Today's formal presentation materials can be found under the Investor Relations section of Liberty Global's website at libertyglobal.com. After today's formal presentation, instructions will be given for a question and answer session. Page 2 of the slides details the company's safe harbor statement regarding forward-looking statements. Today's presentation may include forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995, including the company's expectations with respect to its outlook and future growth prospects, and other information and statements that are not historical fact. These forward-looking statements involve certain risks that could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed or implied by these statements. These risks include those detailed in Liberty Global's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, including its most recently filed Forms 10-Q and 10-K as amended. Liberty Global disclaims any obligation to update any of these forward-looking statements to reflect any change in its expectations or in the conditions on which any such statement is based. I would now like to turn the call over to Mr. Mike Fries. Thanks, operator, and welcome, everyone, to our Q4 results call. As promised, uh, this will be a slightly longer session today with prepared remarks covering first our results and then followed by a brief strategy update that we think you'll find pretty interesting. About 20 or so slides in total, so bear with us. I promise we will leave plenty of time for questions as we've scheduled this call for 90 minutes. Now, as usual, I'm joined by essentially my entire leadership team, so we should be prepared to answer pretty much any question you may have. And with that, I'll get started on slide four with three key takeaways from our fourth quarter and fiscal year 2023 results. I mean, message number one is that overall, we feel good about our operating performance despite the macro and competitive headwinds we've been managing through this past year. Every market was focused on commercial and marketing initiatives that reinvigorated growth in the fourth quarter as we added 80,000 postpaid mobile subs and saw improved broadband performance in Switzerland, Belgium, and Holland. In every market, we continue to focus on the right balance between value and volume, with price adjustments supporting stable to growing revenues. Financially, we saw a strong Q4 with accelerated EBITDA at VMO2 and Sunrise, which reported nearly 8% and 6% growth, respectively. Importantly, this enabled us to deliver on all of our OPCO guidance metrics for the full year and to actually exceed our original distributable cash flow guidance when you exclude the unexpected tax payment in Q4. And then lastly, we remain ahead of plan on synergy execution with both the UK and Switzerland around two-thirds of the way through their respective targets. More on all of this as we move through the slides, I promise. The last big takeaway is that our balance sheet, liquidity profile, and capital allocation model are strong and intact. Charlie will dive into most of these topics later, but certainly a highlight is our repurchase of 18.5% of our shares through the end of 2024, funded by our distributable cash flow. And we'll spend plenty of time on our balance sheet and cash position today, but the punchline is we are extremely well positioned with long-dated fixed-rate debt and over $4 billion in cash and liquid securities. Now, slide 5 provides our usual subscriber trend analysis for each of our four core markets. On the top left, you'll see results for Virgin Media 02, which delivered another positive quarter in both postpaid mobile and broadband net ads, despite a highly competitive market. On broadband, VMO2 remains the market leader, with customers receiving, on average, five times the average speed relative to competitors. And we're seeing a discernible increase in demand for higher speed services year over year. And in mobile, our complementary dual brand strategy with O2 and GiftGap drove positive postpaid ads for the quarter and the full year. In Switzerland, on the top right of the slide, we see an improvement in Q4 broadband net ads driven by commercial initiatives, including a strong Black Friday campaign. And importantly, we're seeing reduced effects from the UPC migration that impacted net ads throughout most of 2023. Over 50% of the base has been migrated now, with the remaining customers expected to be largely value neutral. And similar to the UK, our mobile flanker brand strategy in Switzerland is supporting strong, positive post-pay growth. 
In Belgium, on the bottom left, we saw improved commercial momentum in Q4 driven by successful fixed mobile uh, marketing campaigns and targeted hardware offers. Net subscriber performance, though, continues to be impacted by elevated churn due to the competition and IT migration issues that we experienced last year. But we're stepping up in 2024 our efforts to regain commercial agility across the footprint. In addition, Telenet's advanced digital platform, uh, their footprint expansion into the south of Belgium, as well as the launch of fiber services will provide critical commercial momentum in this year. Finally, the Dutch broadband market remained highly competitive in Q4 during which Vodafone Ziggo remained disciplined on value over volume questions. This contributed to another quarter of broadband losses, but we did see a good response from our broadband speed increases as well as our smart Wi-Fi offers, which generated higher sales in Q4 versus prior periods and a slightly better broadband result. And meanwhile, mobile postpaid growth in Holland remained strong throughout the year, despite the price rise we took in October. Now, the next slide presents our revenue growth for each market by segment. This is an important chart. And it's worth calling out a few numbers on here. If you run your eyes across the top line, you'll see that total revenue in the last two years has been broadly stable, with the pressure we see in fixed offset by our two growth drivers, mobile and B2B. Now, we discussed the dynamics of our consumer fixed business on every quarterly call. As in the past, we continue to be impacted by declining video and voice subscribers, as well as ARPU and churn pressure as customers optimize their services in these more challenging economic times. Now, we'll get into this a bit more on the next slide, but we are taking action to manage these headwinds. And it's worth noting that our operations in Holland, Belgium, and Switzerland saw improved fixed revenue trends year over year. The remaining numbers on this chart are all green, meaning our mobile and B2B businesses are growing consistently year over year. Our consumer mobile revenue, which represents between 20 and 40 percent of total revenue of each OPCO, is supported by postpaid volume growth and pricing actions. And B2B, which generally represents around 20% of total revenue, remains a consistent growth business for us here. We have an opportunity to gain significant market share, and we're focused on broadening our enterprise offerings beyond connectivity into the cloud, ICT, and managed services. So what are we doing to continue the momentum in our mobile and fixed businesses that we saw in Q4? Well, we outlined some of these commercial initiatives on slide seven. On the mobile front, there are four key drivers of future growth. First, we will continue to underpin mobile service revenue with price rises that are now embedded into all contracts except Belgium. We're also seeing great response to our loyalty programs, especially with our premium brands. There is no shortage of demand for tickets to live sports and music events, and we provide those. Our flanker brands, which are generally digital first and operating with really lean cost structures, will continue to contribute significant growth. And finally, our 5G upgrades are making good progress. We're fully 5G in Holland and Switzerland and between 50 and 66% upgraded in the U.K. and Belgium. On our consumer fixed business, four key drivers are also at work here in 2024 and beyond. First, we have strategies in place to combat the headwinds from a declining video and fixed voice business. It's important to point out that our customer losses in these two segments are significantly smaller than the U.S. market. Nonetheless, we are bundling streaming services everywhere and putting together significant entertainment packages that differentiate us from competitors. As with mobile, we are well positioned to execute price rises across the footprint in 2024. And if you look at the bottom of the chart, you can see our fixed ARPU trends over the last three years. Now, while ARPU is declining modestly in the UK and Switzerland, we're actually growing fixed ARPU in Belgium, Holland, and Ireland. And then finally, as expected, we'll see continued growth in our fixed business coming from our network upgrade and expansion plans, which is a great segue to my last slide before turning it over to Charlie. Here we provide an update on our fixed network upgrade and expansion plans. The chart on the left shows our 32 million homes passed today by market. It's important to always lead with the fact that in every country, we are currently able to market a one gig speed product to 100% of our footprint with an easy and an inexpensive path to two and a half gigs when and where we want. Beyond that, however, we are squarely focused on upgrading our networks to 10 gig speeds and expanding the reach of our networks, either through new build or whole by access. Now, with respect to network expansion, our next fiber JV in the UK is about to pass 1 million new fiber homes off the virgin footprint and just announced a 1 billion pound investment program for 2024. The ultimate goal here is to add an additional 5 to 7 million homes. And in Belgium and Ireland, we will expand our reach through whole buyer arrangements. In total, we expect to have increased our footprint by 2026, another 6 million homes to over 38 million homes. Now, fiber is obviously the biggest component of our upgrade plans. In fact, by 2028, 70% of those 38 million homes will be FTTH. 
Our biggest program is in the U.K., where we are well underway upgrading our 16 million home HFC network. We are doing the same across our 1 million homes in Ireland. And, of course, in Belgium, our new Netco Wire is ramping its fiber upgrade plans. So in summary, a strong fourth quarter operationally, which we believe sets us up for continued commercial and strategic momentum in 2024. And with that, I'll turn it over to Charlie to walk through our financial results as well as our guidance for the current fiscal year. Charlie? Thanks, Mike. Uh, turning to our 2023 key financials, across our companies, we saw stable to growing revenues across our core markets. In line with their revised guidance, VMO2 delivered stable revenue in 2023, despite continued fixed pressures and weak handset sales. Underlying service revenue trends remain positive. Vodafone Zigo delivered 1% revenue growth in 2023, driven by a strong Q4 performance, supported by a 10% level price rise in October. And Telenet delivered 1% revenue growth in 2023, supported by their price rise in June and a return to growth in Q4. Sunrise delivered stable revenue in 2023, despite the headwinds resulting from the migration of the UPC backbook onto the Sunrise brand. Growth of 2.5% in Q4 was primarily driven by mobile and B2B. Turning to EBITDA, Virgin Media 2 met their full-year guidance here as well, delivering 3.8% rebase in adjusted EBITDA growth for full year 23. Adjusted EBITDA growth was primarily supported by strong execution on synergies as the business tracks ahead of their original plan, although this did result in higher cost to capture in the year than we originally projected. Vodafone Ziggum met their full-year guidance of low mid-single digit decline as the business worked through the extraordinary cost inflation impacts that we've been highlighting since the beginning of the year, particularly in energy. Telenet delivered stable EBITDA for the year and achieved guidance despite an IT issue that impacted customer services from Q2. And finally, Sunrise posted strong adjusted EBITDA growth in Q4 and in full year 2023 came in towards the top of their guidance range, supported by good execution of the merger synergies and the in-year price rise. On the next slide is a breakdown of our free cash flow profile for 2023 by operating company. We ended the full year 2023 modestly ahead of our original $1.6 billion distributable cash flow guidance, excluding an unanticipated U.S. tax payment of $315 million related to a historic 2010 disposal in Japan that was paid very late on in Q4. On a reported basis, we generated $1.4 billion of distributable cash flow. To call out a few items on the central adjusted free cash flow, the central net spend for the year was at the low end of our annual $200 to $250 million target. On tax, as we've highlighted before, there was a $60 million outflow related to our ongoing U.S. mandatory repatriation tax that was deferred in 2017. We expect 2024 outflows for this tax to be around $80 million and $100 million in 2025, with the transition tax falling away in 2026. Positively, given our substantial cash balance through the year, we generated interest income on our cash balance, and we also received around $55 million of dividends from our ventures portfolio. And lastly, we delivered on our capital intensity targets across our operating companies for the year, managing significant investments in 5G and fixed network capacity. Turning to guidance for 2024, we're providing guidance by operating companies, including their free cash flow. As part of the pivot to net asset value, which Mike will discuss, we will not be providing distributable cash flow guidance to the parent going forward, though clearly the distributions of our key subsidiaries will continue to support a healthy cash flow to the parent. The pivot from distributable cash flow guidance to free cash flow guidance by operating companies has been driven primarily by investor demand for additional focus on free cash flow generation of our four core assets. For VMO2, we expect stable to declining revenues, excluding next fiber construction revenues, driven by continued pressures in B2B fixed and handset segments. A low to mid single digit adjusted EBITDA decline, excluding next fiber and cost to capture, driven by investments into future growth drivers. And I'll dive into this a bit more on the next slide. Property and equipment additions of around 2 to 2.2 billion pounds. This is excluding ROU additions, which can be lumpy depending on lease renewals and adjusted free cash flow of around £500 million for the year. Cash distributions to shareholders are targeted to be around £850 million, supported by the proceeds from the stake sale of the CTIL towers. Turning to Sunrise, we expect stable revenue and stable to low single-digit adjusted EBITDA growth, as we expect to see continued support from the July price rise and reduced impact from the UPC brand migration in 2024. Property and equipment additions as a percentage of sales of 16 to 18%, including cost to capture. Cost to capture spend will drop this year, falling to around 15 million Swiss francs, which is mainly CapEx related. 
an adjusted free cash flow of 360 to 400 million Swiss francs for the year, a strong step up versus 2023. For Vodafone Zigger, we expect continued revenue growth supported by pricing actions, low single-digit adjusted EBITDA growth driven by an improved OPEX profile from lower energy costs, property and equipment additions to remain stable year-on-year at 21 to 23% of sales, adjusted free cash flow of around 300 million euros, and cash distributions up to this amount. And finally, on Telenet, we expect broadly stable revenues supported by pricing actions, a mid-single-digit rebased adjusted EBITDA decline due to OPEX investments, such as increased marketing associated with a new converged bundle offering in Wallonia, leveraging the Telenet products and brand across third-party networks, property and equipment additions of around 32% of revenue, driven by the accelerated rollout of fiber homes on our footprint in Flanders and parts of Brussels through the wire netco. And despite the heavy network investments, still positive free cash flow for the year of 50 to 75 million euros. Turning to the last slide before I hand back to Mike, I wanted to detail some of the investment initiatives and drivers for VMO2 in 2024 to support future growth. Since the JB was established, revenue excluding next fiber has been broadly flat, not least due to the headwinds from declining video and voice customers, as well as weaker handset sales than in the past. However, despite these headwinds, we've delivered strong mid-single-digit EBITDA growth, supported by primarily accelerated synergy execution. At the end of 2023, we delivered £359 million of the total synergy run rate target of £540 million, or roughly 66% of the target. However, in 2023 alone, we spent one-off cost to capture of £185 million, depressing the net contribution to free cash flow. As costs to capture fall away with the completion of the Synergy program, we expect to see the full impact of the £540 million of synergies reflected in the company's free cash flows, which should underpin long-term free cash flow generation. And alongside this, over the last few years, we've also been investing in excess of £500 million per year on 5G and fibre upgrade, and prior to that on Project Lightning. We anticipate our fibre upgrade program to be completed in 2028, and we continue to invest in rolling out 5G nationwide. As these programs are completed in the next few years, we expect the capital intensity to reduce substantially. And together with the strong tax assets that these investment programs generate, this should lead to a strong free cash flow conversion and profile in the longer term. 2024 is a key transition year in this journey, as we are accelerating investments, not just in mobile and fixed networks, but also in initiatives to underpin long-term revenue growth. In particular, in 2024, we are increasing investment in IT efficiency programs, transforming the customer experience, marketing initiatives to support new product launches, and also operating expenses associated with selling into the rapidly expanding Next Fiber network. The foundations from these investments that we are laying in 2024 should create a strong platform for growth in the subsequent years. Now, with that, I'll pass over to Mike to start the strategy update. Thanks, Charlie, and nice job. Um, So that concludes our prepared remarks on our Q4 and 2023 results, which means we're going to transition now to our strategy update. Hopefully you've got a copy of these slides in front of you as well because there's quite a bit of information to cover. And I'm on the first slide, slide 14, I believe, which summarizes pretty much everything we're going to talk about today, beginning at the top with a statement that I believe captures our main message to you here clearly and concisely, which is moving forward, Our strategy will be focused on maximizing the inherent value of our core assets, which we believe is substantial, and importantly, delivering that value to shareholders over time. So how does that differ from what we've been doing? The clear pivot here is in the commitment to take the financial and strategic steps necessary to deliver that value to you, which will come in three ways. First, we will continue to focus on shrinking our equity so long as our stock trades at a sizable discount. But second, in certain circumstances, we intend to actually put that value in your hands through dividends, spinoffs, tracking stocks. And third, as we execute on this plan, we also expect to deliver that value in the form of a higher share price. Now, you might be asking, why now? Well, we've been working towards this moment for some time. For starters, we've completely repositioned our portfolio of operating businesses over the last six or seven years. We were among the first to see the importance of fixed mobile convergence in Europe, which led us to sell more than 25 billion in cable assets over that time frame at an average of 11 times EBITDA, and acquire or merge with the best mobile companies in our remaining markets. Now, you would also know 
that we put nearly all of those net proceeds, around $14 billion, back into our stock by purchasing over 60% of our shares since January 2017 and what we believe are attractive prices. And then lastly, with your support as shareholders, we successfully redomiciled our company to Bermuda, which has created significantly more corporate flexibility to do some of the things we will talk about today. So all of the pieces of the puzzle are in place, and we intend to take advantage of this moment. In the middle of the slide, you'll see five announcements we're making today, each of which brings this strategy to life. I'll run through these quickly because there's a slide on each of them coming up. First, we have started the process of listing our Swiss subsidiary Sunrise in anticipation of spinning off 100% of those shares to Liberty Global shareholders in the second half of the year. Second, we have created a new holding company called Liberty Global Benelux to own and manage our interest in both Telenet and Vodafone Zigo. Third, we have agreed with our partner Telefonica to begin the process of creating a separate netco comprising our 16 million home HFC and fiber footprint in the UK today. Fourth, we are announcing an agreement to sell one of our content assets in the venture portfolio, All3 Media, for 12 times EBITDA, or roughly 400 million of net proceeds to us. And then finally, we're also announcing today our intention to buy up to 10% of our shares in calendar 2024. Now, these amount, announcements, each in their own way, reinforce our commitment to delivering value to shareholders. In the next 20 minutes or so, we'll talk about each of these, as well as our view on the positioning and valuation of our underlying assets and how we see generating and allocating capital moving forward. So before getting into each of these transactions, I thought it would be useful to step back and highlight some of the financial structural and strategic advantages that define who we are, that make us unique relative to our peer group, and provide the critical tools we need to execute on this plan. Six of them are listed here on slide 15. The first of those is our strong track record of capital allocation. Charlie's going to show you a slide in a moment which outlines how we've generated and invested over $23 billion of net M&A proceeds and free cash flow over the last six to seven years. <clears throat> There's three points to make here. First, we believe we are outstanding buyers, builders, and sellers of businesses in this sector, full stop. I think that's evidenced by the deals I just referenced. You know, few operators, if any, have a 30-year track record like ours in this space. In Germany, for example, which we sold to Vodafone in 2019, we invested 2 billion euros of equity over seven years and took out over 13 billion euros in dividends and net sale proceeds. You can do that math. Second, we are committed to value creation for shareholders. All the steps we've taken, exiting markets at a premium, our buyback program, and our announcements today demonstrate that we are not empire builders. We are value creators. And third, we have ongoing sources of capital that will fuel these and future opportunities to deliver that value to you. Now, the next three tools listed on this slide are structural advantages that are also critical. Our balance sheet is built for value creation. We have no corporate debt. Rather, all our debt is siloed into our operating businesses, totally portable in terms of transaction flexibility with no change of control restrictions, and de-risked from a point of view of interest rates, currencies, and maturities. This is a major strategic asset and point of differentiation for us. Now, most of you are aware that we go to great lengths to ensure that we're optimizing our tax position for the benefit of shareholders throughout our business, always within the rules and regulations, of course, but with a focus and capability that is second to none. And I already mentioned Bermuda and the benefits that brings. We could not be happier with our current corporate structure. Number five on this slide references our unwavering commitment to shareholder remuneration. I've given you the historical numbers. And our announcements today would result in the largest shareholder return in our history when you include the buyback commitment, the spinoff of Sunrise, and the investment we plan to make pre-spin to deliver that business. More on that in a moment. And then finally, we're sitting on some of the best operating businesses in Europe, as well as some scaled assets and strategic platforms that you may not be familiar with, all of which create a pipeline of opportunity for value creation and value delivery moving forward. That's a good segue to the next slide, because the most important source of both future value creation and future value distribution is our FMC operating companies. And here on slide 16, we provide a framework for evaluating each of these businesses on the basis of market structure, convergence, synergy execution, network investment, infrastructure monetization, and the opportunity to pursue equity capital markets transactions. There's a lot of information on this chart. I'd encourage you to go through it after the call. I'm just going to hit the highlights for you. First, it should be clear that Sunrise is best positioned today 
to pursue an equity capital markets transaction, and not surprisingly, that's why we're announcing the spinoff. The Swiss market is highly rational. Sunrise is fully converged and nearly done with synergies. The transition to 5G is complete. We have access to nationwide HFC and fiber with very efficient CapEx profiles. And these factors and more support a strong free cash flow profile. Now, moving to our other markets, the operations under Liberty Gold Benelux are also well positioned. These are rational market structures and fully converged operations with synergies complete. While we're at different stages of 5G and fiber in each country, the infrastructure opportunity in both markets is substantial. The Dutch business has yet to monetize towers, for example, and our Netco in Belgium, which we call Wire, is one of the most penetrated and profitable fixed infrastructures in Europe. And I'll talk about all of this and more in a moment. Our joint venture with Telefonica, Virgin Media 2, is also in a unique position. We're still in the early stages of our 5G and fiber investment cycle, and synergies are still being implemented, but the infrastructure opportunity is substantial, with both Towers and our announced UK Netco providing a source of monetization, financing optionality, and value creation. Overall, this is our largest business and one that we remain extremely excited about. Now, I've referenced value and value creation several times already. One of our goals today is to discuss valuation with you, in particular how we view our stock relative to our peers and the strategies we're pursuing. And this is perhaps the most important slide we'll present. And analysts and investors alike are aware of the significant discount in our stock, which we've been taking advantage of, of course, with our own buyback program. But as we've indicated today, the time has come to bridge that gap. And here we quantify that gap for you with our own some of the parts analysis. Now, I'll start by acknowledging that there are many ways to approach valuation and that reasonable people can disagree on assumptions and methodology. But we believe that the numbers we are presenting here on this slide are the clearest and most defendable. Let me walk you through it. We begin on the top left with our current share price of $20. If you subtract our cash balance, which is equivalent to $10 per share, and you subtract our listed equity stakes, these are listed equity stakes, which are worth $2 per share, you're left with two things the value of our ventures portfolio, and our interest in our FMC champions. Now, Charlie will talk about ventures in a moment, but you should know that we have these assets valued regularly by an independent third party, and we've demonstrated to you a willingness and an ability to turn these investments into cash over time. We think together they represent $6 per share. So where does that leave the value of our proportionate interest in our core FMC operations, which total in the aggregate, I remind you, $25 billion of revenue, $85 million connections, and $9.3 billion of EBITDA? In our analysis, about $2 per share or $800 million. Clearly viewed through this lens, there is a major disconnect. So what do we think our proportionate interest in Sunrise, Liberty Global, Benelux, VMO2 are worth? There's many ways to arrive at that figure, but one of the simplest and perhaps least subjective ways is to look at our peer group. If you simply apply the public trading multiples for operating free cash flow of our incumbent competitors in the U.K., Holland, and Switzerland, along with the transaction value for a recent delisting of Telenet, you arrive at around $30 per share. Now, that's not $30 per share for Liberty Global. That's $30 per share just for the FMC component of our sum of the parts valuation. In fact, the implied value for Liberty Global would be closer to $48 per share. Now, we're not suggesting that the stock will or should trade there immediately, but we believe there is significant embedded value in our operating companies. Even if you apply a discount to cash, and a discount to our listed stakes and a discount to ventures, you're still going to arrive at a number for the implied value of our FMC operations significantly below $30. Have a go. You know, when the call is over, you can see what I mean. And this is the reason for listing and spinning off Switzerland, which we describe in a bit more detail in a second. We're going to hand that value, that fully distributed value, to investors. So turning to slide 18, we're really excited about the Sunrise transaction. On the left-hand side here, we highlight the basic elements of the deal, which will see us list and spin 100% of the shares to Liberty shareholders. Prior to that, and this is important, we are committed to investing up to $1.7 billion to delever Sunrise, which will optimize the fully distributed value of the stock and, therefore, the value of the dividend to you. Now, the rationale for this deal is clear. In addition to helping us demonstrate the underlying value of our assets, Sunrise is a compelling equity story. The Swiss market is one of the strongest in Europe with very attractive macro characteristics and a rational telecom sector. As one of the most advanced operators in Europe, Sunrise generates significant free cash flow, and the management team has a great track record. Andre Creuset, for example, was the CEO of Sunrise when we took the company private and is highly respected in the Swiss financial market. Some other considerations worth pointing out, 
We will fund the $1.7 billion from three sources, the sale of all three media, the free cash flow generated by Sunrise this year, and less than a billion of our corporate cash. It's worth repeating that we do not require any third-party investment or financing to achieve this transaction. Look, if, if somebody wants to approach us uh, on a strategic or financial basis and they want to participate on terms that are acceptable to us, we may listen to that. But this deal is happening either way. A couple other points. The actual listing will be on the Swiss exchange with a similar voting structure, Delivery Global, today. J.P. Morgan and UBS have been appointed as advisors And the goal is to make the transaction tax-free to U.S. shareholders and possibly other jurisdictions to be determined. So stay tuned for more information and also for the announced timing of Sunrise's Capital Markets Day. Rondre and the team will walk through the entire story. It's a good one. Now, turning to the Benelux, we're announcing today the creation of Liberty Global Benelux, a holding company which owns our interest in Belgium and Holland. Rationale for this move is also clear. Together, these two operations will create one of the largest FMC platforms in Europe with $7 billion of pro forma combined revenue and $3 billion of EBITDA. That would make Liberty Global Benelux on an aggregate basis comparable in size to KPN or Swisscom. Also, strategic growth plans for both of these operations have a lot of similarities. I mean, specifically, a focus on entertainment differentiation, fixed network development, and digital and AI initiatives. In addition, we think a single operational focus should help drive best practices across these programs, as well as cross-border efficiencies and, importantly, financial synergies. Perhaps most importantly, we see multiple avenues for value creation going forward. For example, both operations have significant infrastructure assets. The Dutch operation is yet to monetize towers, and, of course, Telenet sitting, as I said, on one of the more sophisticated and profitable infrastructures in Europe. The new holding company provides an optimal tax and governance structure, and it gives us a vehicle to be opportunistic as we explore market consolidation and potentially other inorganic opportunities. We also believe that as a scale player in the region, Liberty Global Benelux will be attractive to strategic and financial investors and could be an ideal candidate for equity capital markets transactions when the timing is right. So we'll have a lot more to say about this platform as plans develop. Now, the next slide summarizes our intention to create a UK netco comprising all of our Virgin Media O2 fixed network assets in the UK. This is a significant milestone for VMO2 and one of the most important announcements we're making today. As you know, we've invested considerable time and capital developing our fixed network strategy in the UK. Specifically, we've made substantial progress on two core initiatives. First, expanding our network reach through our JV with Infravia called Next Fiber, which will have built around a million fiber to the home premises by the end of Q1, is fully financed, by the way and just announced that they will spend a billion pounds this year growing the fiber footprint. And then secondly, we've begun the process of upgrading VMO2's HFC network to fiber with over 3 million of our 16 million homes already fiber today. And it's this second program that would be folded into the UK Netco, which will result, I think, in multiple benefits. First, it underpins our commitment to fiber in this market by consolidating these 16 million homes under one dedicated team, strategy, and balance sheet. This should provide greater focus on the pace and efficiency of the upgrade and the opportunity to generate wholesale revenue. Second, it creates considerable optionality around financing and monetization of VMO2's fixed network. Day one, this will be among the largest and most profitable fixed network infrastructures in Europe. And third, it creates an ideal vehicle for potential consolidation of what is today a very fragmented alt-net market in the UK. This is a particularly important element of the plan. And we in Telefonic are quite excited about this development. The timing is right, the market is ready, and the opportunities it will create are significant. Now, moving to slide 21, thrilled to announce today the sale of all three media to Redbird IMI. You might have seen the press releases. As a reminder, this is our 50-50 content production venture with Warner Brothers Discovery. The price of 1.15 billion pounds, or about 12 times EBITDA, represents a premium for what we believe is one of the best independent producers in Europe. The transaction should close in the second or third quarter of this year and would result in total proceeds to us of around $400 million when you include the repayment of an attractive piece of mezzanine debt we provided to the company some time ago. Now, as I mentioned, our goal is to use this cash to support a portion of the investment into Sunrise pre-spin. This is a great example, by the way, of us rotating our capital into accretive transactions. Now, while we're happy with this outcome, I have to say it's a bittersweet moment for us at Liberty. Jane Turton and her team have done an outstanding job 
building one of the most important content platforms today. And we know that she's going to continue to be a driving force in this industry, and we're super proud of everything they've accomplished. And then finally, one of the main messages here today is our commitment to shareholder remuneration. And by this, of course, we mean both buybacks and distributions like the spinoff of Sunrise. The left-hand side of this slide just repeats what we've said a couple times already. We've already repurchased around 60% of the shares since 2017, spending $14 billion, and we currently sit at 378 million shares today, down from $900 million in January of 2017. On the right-hand side, though, we show you our 2024 shareholder remuneration plans. Here now, there are three components this year. And the familiar one, of course, is our intention to buy back up to 10% of the shares. This could total as much as $800 million based on our current market cap and funded in part from distributions we expect to receive from our FMC Opcos. But the second component is the spinoff of Sunrise, and I'm not going to put a dollar figure on that dividend today. There's a lot of work to do to finalize that number, obviously. But whatever value you or the analysts assign to our equity in Sunrise today, you would need to increase that value by the third component, which is the $1.7 billion of cash we are contributing to the company pre-closing to reduce leverage. In other words, we're essentially distributing the $1.7 billion in cash to you, the investors. And when you add all three of those up, it's going to be a record year for shareholder remuneration, I believe. All of that on a market cap of under $8 billion. So a lot to digest in these announcements. But I think it's all very good news in our view. Uh, and I'll now turn it over to Charlie, who's going to run through a few more key points on capital allocation, on our balance sheet, and on ventures. Charlie, over to you. Thanks, Mike. Turning to the next slide on capital allocation, firstly, I wanted to start with a high-level view of our historic capital allocation, which has been focused on driving shareholder value through buybacks, M&A, and modest investments into ventures. Taking the period 2017 to the end of 2023, which started with the sale of Germany and Central Eastern Europe to Vodafone, we generated around $14 billion in net after-tax proceeds from asset sales, and alongside that, primarily from distributable cash flow at our FMC champions, we distributed to the parent company over $9 billion of distributable cash flow. As you can see in the bottom half, we have put this capital to work by spending $14 billion buying back our stock, reducing the number of shares outstanding by around 60% since January 2017, $4 billion in M&A transactions, primarily invested in the acquisition of Sunrise, $2 billion in our ventures portfolio, in particular fast-growing sectors such as infrastructure, where we hope to create new unicorn assets and retaining around $4 billion in cash. In addition to our current cash balance of $3.7 billion, we also have $900 million of listed equity securities, as well as $2.3 billion of venture assets, where we're on track to make disposals to support our $500 million to $1 billion target of non-core asset disposals by the end of this year, which give us potential liquidity to allocate of just under $7 billion. Despite investing in the transition of our mobile networks to 5G and fiber capacity in many of our markets, each of our key FMCs continue to generate upstreamable cash flow, which will provide us with further capital to allocate. Now, in allocating this capital, in addition to using up to $1.7 billion to facilitate the spin of Sunrise, we are targeting to purchase another 10% of our shares outstanding during calendar 2024, we will consider investing capital to exist strategically leveraging into other transactions with our FMC OPCOs. We will remain opportunistic on M&A opportunities in our core markets, and we will selectively invest in our ventures portfolio assets such as Next Fiber, Atlas Edge, and other growth opportunities in our key ventures thematics of tech, content, and infra. We also consider opportunities to grow our tech and services platforms through partnerships and or infill acquisitions. And this is particularly true in our central and corporate operations, where we're increasingly unlocking further value, such as Liberty Financial Services, which has already built out a number of third-party relationships. Moving to the next slide. All our cash and liquidity remains at the parent company, which has virtually no debt. And our debt stacks are siloed at the key FMC assets. Now, this means that each debt stack operates independently of the other and means that there is no risk of financial distress in one of them impacting any of the others. Within each FMC debt stack, we remain committed to maintaining target leverage of four to five times through the cycle, which has served us well over the past 20 years. And in managing that debt, our treasury principles have not changed during the various financing cycles, and we remain committed to proactive refinancing of debt to ensure a long average maturity. 
and fully fixing the interest rates on our debt, and also to swap all our non-functional currency debt back into the functional currency of the debt silo. Our debt silos currently have an average life of six years at a fixed interest rates, with no material maturities until 2028. We also have significant undrawn revolving credit facilities in each of the FMCs locked in until 2029, totaling $4.4 billion of additional liquidity should we need it. And so to conclude, we feel very good about the balance sheets of our various OPCOs and retain significant cash and liquid investments at our unlevered parent. But we will remain proactive in pushing out the average life of our debt and, as is the case at Sunrise, could opportunistically delever in strategic moves, for example, to highlight the equity value better for our shareholders. Moving to my last slide on ventures, our ventures portfolio is split into four pillars and the year-end fair market value closed at $3.3 billion. Now, it's important to reiterate that whilst we present the fair market value each quarter to help our investors value the portfolio, it's also regularly reviewed and aligned with a third-party valuation report. And the fluctuation in value quarter to quarter reflects not just that, but also new invested capital, disposals, and changes in that fair market value. Before I dive into the strategy of each pillar, the aim today is to provide some more color beyond the usual disclosure on the key investments in each pillar, and also to give some more concrete data around our total returns for shareholders. To be clear up front, when we are referring to net invested capital in each pillar against the current fair market value, that is reflecting firstly the money we've invested, secondly the proceeds from any divestments, and thirdly also reflects the dividends and interest over the relevant period. Starting with tech, which is the longest running vertical, like many of our peers, Comcast, Deutsche Telekom, we selectively make relatively small investments into tech companies that provide benefits to our core FMC champions, including early visibility and access to new tech platforms and revenue streams. This has proven to be a successful strategy, with a tech portfolio on today's fair market value worth $700 million, against net invested capital now of only around $100 million, given that we've realized over $500 million in disposals, often when there is a natural liquidity event, and it delivered a cumulative mid-teens IRR, excluding the strategic benefits to our opcos. As a result, our tech pillar is largely self-funding, with profits being reinvested into innovative new technologies and platforms that provide benefits to our core FMC champions, such as smart broadband AI and digital security. Moving to content, which is worth $1.5 billion compared to net invested capital since inception of $1.4 billion. Much of this original invested capital actually came from the sale of our original content investment, Cello Media, which we sold in 2014 for over $1 billion, having grown that from a small initial investment in 2004. With the content pillar, we hold strategic stakes in legacy and new investments within the media, content, and sports sectors. The emphasis here is on harvesting legacy investments but also supporting future unicorn assets such as Formula E, which is performing well. Moving on to our infrastructure pillar, this is focused on creating unicorns within the data center, last mile fiber, and emerging energy markets by leveraging our infrastructure track record and scale. This is a recent vertical and perhaps the one we're most excited about. As you can see, there's been a significant uplift in fair market value of around $600 million underpinned as we were able to seed our original investments into Atlas Edge, for example, by using technical property assets from the FMCs. To date, our net cash investment in this vertical has been relatively small, but we see good opportunities to invest capital in high return, success-based capex, particularly in the data center space, which is seeing explosive growth from accelerating shift to cloud and the additional demand resulting from AI rollouts. I want to emphasize that we think about investing in infra is a core competency where we have a clear right to play. Firstly, we can often use our own assets to seed and grow them. Secondly, we can often partner here with strong strategic partners such as Digital Bridge, which complement our own access to capital. And importantly, there is a clear growth, particularly in the data center segment, which would command high multiples, both public and private. One asset that we are excited about is Atlas Edge, and to give some headline color on it today, and we will expand on this in future sessions. Atlas Edge has expanded to over 100 sites across Europe, making it one of the largest edge co-location footprints in Europe. We raised standalone financing in 2023 of around 750 million euros to fund growth, and the financing was led by a best-in-class LG Treasury team, who will also support future growth and acquisitions. We have industry-leading management team in place, alongside the support from Liberty Global and Digital Bridge. 
and growth has been supported by acquisitions such as DC1 in February 2023, which has just announced the opening of a brand new data center in Hamburg. Finally, our financial pillar contains opportunistic positions in public debt or equity that provide yield and or strategic optionality that we also include in the liquidity I discussed earlier. The yield on these strategic investments is typically higher than our return on cash, while allowing us near-term liquidity if we want it. We will look at ways not just to return value to shareholders through selective cash disposals, but also opportunities over time to highlight the value of these growth assets by contributing them to or crystallizing them with listed vehicles, including potentially tracking stocks. With that, Mike, I'll just turn it over to you to conclude. Thanks, Charlie. And now that concludes our prepared remarks for this brief strategy update. I'm just going to close with five key takeaways. And these are the things you want to focus on as you digest this information, I think. First of all, this is a clear pivot in our strategy. That is clear. Uh, we realize that the time is right to not only create value, but to distribute that value to shareholders if and when we can. By the way, this is not a new strategy. You know, John and the Liberty Companies have been practicing this for decades. Liberty Global itself was spun off from Liberty Media. So this is a well-known path, and we're excited to pursue it. Second, the spinoff of Sunrise, together with our buyback commitment, reflects a significant commitment to investor returns. As I mentioned just a moment ago in my remarks, this will be a record year for shareholder remuneration at a time when our share price reflects perhaps its largest discount. And we expect to see that discount shrink. Third, this is unlikely to be our last equity capital markets transaction or unique value creation event. Each of our FMC operations are positioned well for growth, for strategic moves, for asset monetizations, and at the right time for potential equity market or financing transactions that would be value accretive. The pipeline is full. That's the main point. And fourth, our ventures portfolio is not a hobby. Many of these assets are significant in their own right and are already there or on their way to becoming billion or multi-billion dollar unicorns themselves. These investments support our strategic and technology plans and could themselves be assets that we consider distributing or sharing with investors. And then finally, we have significant cash and liquidity to implement the strategic roadmap we've just outlined. And just as importantly, we have the ability to replenish that liquidity through both upstream free cash flow from our operating companies and asset sales as and when needed. Needless to say, we are extremely excited about the future. I want to thank you for your patience today. I know it's been a long call, and I know we covered a lot of ground, but we really look forward to your questions. And operating, we are ready to go. The question and answer session will be conducted electronically. If you would like to ask a question, please do so by pressing the star or asterisk key, followed by the digit 1 on your phone. In order to accommodate everyone, we request that you ask only one question. If you are using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. We'll pause for just a moment to give everyone the, an opportunity to join the queue. The first question comes from the line of Steve Malcolm with Redburn Atlantic. Your line is now open. <clears throat> yeah, good afternoon, guys, and, and thanks for letting me ask a question. It's hard to just ask one, so it'll probably be one about 17 parts, but, but let's have a go to the UK. Um, can, Obviously, sort of hinging on the, the, the net coast, surf coast separation is, is your fiber trajectory. You're up to 4 million homes in the UK. Can you just sort of give us a sense of, you know, what the mix of that between next fiber and, and the business as usual footprint is? And looking forward, just help us understand the moving parts of your CapEx guidance. Um, looked a little higher than I thought this year, 2.2 2 for 24, but, you know, you've talked about it falling off in future years. How do we think about the, the, the fiber upgrade? The, the 5G investment, and also maybe just touch on cost of capture, because it looks like you'll have sort of got to the 700 million pounds by the end of this year, whether that disappears from 25. So a few sort of questions wrapped into UK CapEx and cost of capture there in fiber. Um, hopefully you can help us out. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's pretty uh, straightforward. I don't know whether we've disclosed this much detail, but I'll go ahead and do it. I mean, if you look at the 4 million homes, um, our fiber up or our upgrade program represents about 1.5 million of those at this point. Next fiber, about 800,000. And the balance are homes that we built through our lightning program, uh, a slightly different technology, fiber technology, but nonetheless fiber about 1.9 million. And that, of course, that program 
going into 24, the Lightning program ceases, so there will be no more upgrades via Lightning as such. But the next fiber uh, plan, which has, I think, been publicized, should build a million plus. And fiber up itself, which you probably haven't publicized, will build more than it built last year. So, uh, you know, four million will go to, you know, who knows, six, six and a half million. But, but the breakdown is, as I just described it, hopefully that helps. Um, the vast majority of that is in next fiber, which, of course, is off footprint. The CapEx that you referenced includes only the CapEx to upgrade, um, you know, the, at roughly 100 pounds of home. The, uh, the homes that we would be continuing to upgrade on the 16 million home footprint. That, 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 is that clear? Can, can you tell me that? Yeah, w w what run rate are you at on Project Mustang now, Mike? I mean, are you, you know, in terms of 100,000 premises per quarter? And, you know, yeah, well, we did, uh, I think we did roughly, eight, eight, four, five, yeah, we did, we did eight or 900,000, I believe, in 23, and we should do more than that in 24. Okay, thanks. Uh, just on the sort of overall capex picture in the UK, you've got lots of things going on. Help us understand, you know, how we think about 24, 25, and 26. 5G, fiber, you know, what? I think, I, yeah, I, I, I I think my, you know, fiber's got. Yeah, Newt is on, so I'll let him dive into it. But I think 24 includes obviously what I just described, as well as a fair amount of mobile capex to advance our 5G plans. And you know, our sense is. Well, I'll let Lutz handle it in terms of where we are on peak capex intensity. Lutz, are you on? Might yeah, I, I, I'm on. Hi, Mike. Hi, Steve. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear yeah, you fine. Okay. Can you, you hear me? The question? Yeah, yeah we I'll hear do. you. Sorry, sorry. I've got the question. Uh, okay, sorry for that. Um, so, I mean, obviously, we don't give a guidance on capex uh, um, longer than uh, the year 24, but Steve, um, uh, broadly, you, you, you don't see any material difference in the upcoming years, right? So we are ramping fiber up, as Mike said. Um, I think we have done close to a million in 23, and we will do a bit more this year. Um, and I think the number is about 100 uh, pounds per home. And then we keep investing into 5G, um, and um, but this is getting cheaper because we have the sh shared rural networks with, with uh, um, Vodafone and 3. So don't don't expect a massive peak in the capex going forward. Hope that helps. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Maurice Patrick with Barclays. Your line is now open. Yes, thanks for taking the question and the presentation earlier. Just one question really on the, um, the UK Netco side. I mean, in the slides you talk about the UK Netco being um, a vehicle for M&A, I think, of AltNets. Um, in the past, Mike, you've talked, I think, about the acquisition of AltNets being more outside the current footprint rather than inside the legacy footprint. So just curious to your thoughts in terms of is it Netco buying Altnet? Is it Next Fiber doing it? Um, and is Next Fiber actually overtly overbuilding Altnet at the moment? Thank you. Yeah, so Next Fiber has its own program and is building, you know, on a priority basis where it sees the best opportunities off the Virgin footprint. So that, that program will continue as is. It, it, it won't be impacted at all by the creation of this UK Netco. And Next Fiber itself might look at Altnet acquisitions as it did more you know recently in 2023 uh, as would the UK Netco and so I think you know you're, you're correct to say that on footprint Altnets have less value to us but they don't have zero value and uh, we're not clear on where exactly the Altnet market will go nobody is but it's nice to have two vehicles for potential consolidation a very sizable and substantial one that has uh, you know, a significant amount of EBITDA day one in terms of, you know, having customers from VMO2 on the UK net code day one and has financing capability day one. But that's a nice thing to have as well as the next fiber, you know, fully financed next fiber JV. So now all we, we think we're just increasing our opportunities uh, to, to be a consolidator if and when appropriate versus confusing or reducing those opportunities. We're actually getting better. I hope that's clear. Great. And, and, and the extent to which Next Fiber is actually overtly overbuilding Altnets currently? 
Uh, I don't know that we've been public on – Andrea may have a view each year, so it's next to our board of where exactly we're building, but I think you should assume, since there's quite a bit of alt-net activity, that in some instances we are, in fact, overbuilding alt-nets, you know, if they're, uh, if they're in the path that we've chosen. But I, I'm not, I don't know that we're giving anybody an exact number about, on that. Okay. Thank you. The, I mean, I can, I can help. It's very, very minor. Yeah, I, I mean, like we, we are doing the rollout for Next Fiber, and obviously um, the plan is to overbuild as less as possible. And so far, we have a very, very little overbuild. Uh, I don't want to tell the number, but it's, it's, it's really more immaterial. Okay, great. Thank you. You got it. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Robert Grindle with Deutsche Bank. Your line is now open. Yeah, thank you. Uh, congratulations on all the initiatives. Um, my question would be around the Benelux Hold Co. And that you left a lot of cash in Telenet, the best part of a billion dollars, and raised new finance to repay the, the Hold Co debt for the minorities uh, rather than dividend up the money. Is the cash left in there? To buy the bit of Vodzigo you don't own or even the bit you do own from the parent company. And, and related to that is, in a nutshell, within what you've announced today, um, what's easier because you're now in Bermuda? Is it more on the approval side of things or something else? Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, Charlie can chime in here, but the cash that was residing in Telenet has been upstreamed for all intents and purposes, so it can easily be downstreamed again. 100% entity, but today that cash is upstream. So the cash, you know, and I think we've we've been clear about the current leverage and net net debt position of Telenet. Um, so that you know, of course, we can do what we want with that over time. Yeah, just just, just to clarify in, that. Yeah, just to clarify that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Dwight. Just to clarify, uh, right. as Mike's quite right, it's been it's now part of the corporate cash, but there is still some cash in Belgium uh, for the time being, just waiting on a tax ruling, but. Um, Mike is absolutely right that, that, that it's essentially ca corporate cash, but it may be located in a Belgian bank account and therefore uh, contributes to the net debt position of Telenet. Sorry, Mike, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's fine. No, that's good clarification. Um, and, and, and then the um, – what was the second question, Robert? Uh, Bermuda, what's, what's, uh, a lot of these things you've announced today might be – you could have done anyway, but I'm just wondering what, if Bermuda really helps well, in give an this example. and other things you yeah. might be considering. Sure. The, um, the implementation of the Sunrise spinoff will require a shareholder vote. Uh, as such, the shareholder vote will be conducted consistent with Bermuda uh, governance, not UK governance. We think that makes it a simpler, you know, more appropriately uh, run process. So there's one big example. Um, you know, I think that's probably the biggest example. Uh, and so um, without getting into detail, because we've gone through the exhaustive benefits, that's just one example of where we think we can, um, you know, achieve an important and strategic transaction for shareholders in a straightforward and predictable way. Got it. Thank you. Uh-huh. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of David Wright with Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Your line is now open. Thank you very much. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, a lot to digest here. Um, so my question, if I'm allowed just one, um, is on, again, the, the Benelux Hold Co. So um, there could potentially be synergies, and I think when we've discussed in the past um, this uh, potential option, uh, there was always not a fiscal synergy potential with the uh, uh, quite significant cash tax now paid at Telnet, maybe some opportunity to uh, migrate NOLs against that. Um, so I guess my question is, if there is fiscal synergy, um, how does that feed up to Vodafone um, as the uh, joint venture um, or the half? How would they benefit from that fiscal synergy that could potentially be given from a sort of Vodafone Ziggo to a Telenet? Or maybe I've um, misunderstood that. Um, that would be great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll let Charlie speak to the synergies more specifically, but I'll, I'll say from the Vodafone perspective, you could argue this is a non-event, meaning 
um, you know, we're entitled to move our 50% interest into any 100% owned company we choose. And rather than own our stake directly in Vodafone Ziggo, we will own it through this holding company, Liberty Global Benelux. In fact, we can even raise capital in this company to a limited degree without their authority or approval um, to a limited degree. And what happens upstairs, if you will, in this holding company is a non-event for them. It's irrelevant. Uh, if, we, uh, if we discover uh, synergies um, you know, between the entities, um, it would have to be synergies that are realized without a consolidation of the two entities, but rather just one that we're generating through our, our, our single focus on management or some other financial benefits we can derive. So I think you would you could argue that from Vodafone's perspective, this is a non-event. They are aware of it. They certainly, you know, are looking at what it might mean to them and strategically or, or, or inorganically. But at this point, it's really what we're doing with our interests and the opportunities we think it creates for us to, to do the things I described um, from the point of view of, of either synergies or financings or capital raising or other things. So, Charlie, you want to talk about synergies? Yeah, sure. And I think there are just two broad points. One is, is clearly um, you know, for the Telenet, the one financing synergy is clearly that the Telenet group would now benefit from the equity value that is now being contributed from a 50% stake. Um, I think the other issue is that um, it does give you an opportunity to do additional tax optimization, which would allow us to uh, increase basis, as they call it. But it's probably something which we can go into offline on the more specifics. But you should see there are opportunities for uh, incremental tax planning. And can I, can I just ask, have you, have you discussed with Vodafone whether they would um, consider sort of blending their stake into a merged entity, or is that even something that we could think about if those synergies start to really um, accrue? Well, I'm not going to comment on what we have or haven't discussed with them, but it's certainly theoretically possible, right? Yeah, yeah cool. All right, thanks, guys. Yeah, I have to be careful. You got it. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Carl Murdoch-Smith with Baron Berg. Your line is now open. Hi, that's great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about price increases in the UK. So on, on slide seven, um, you mentioned that price rises are embedded into contracts. Um, one thing you'll have to navigate this year in the UK is Ofcom's proposed ban on inflation-linked pricing. I wanted to ask how you're thinking about that. Obviously, BT has signaled uh, its planned approach. Are you likely to follow suit with a contractualized absolute price increase, or would you consider reverting to your old approach of ad hoc price increases? And how do the customer service issues you've been facing in the UK play into your thoughts on pricing going forwards? Thank you. Yeah, good question. I'll let Lutz um, handle both of them. But I'll simply say that on the price increases, we can and expect to take price increases in a manner similar to 2023, given the timing of when our price, recre our price increases are expected to occur. So we don't believe the Ofcom um, issue impacts 2024 price increases as it currently stands. But, Luce, you want to talk any further about that? And let's, I'll let you deal into customer service. Yeah. Um, good yeah. afternoon, Carl. Yeah. Um, so first of all, Ofcom right, is currently uh, reviewing the price increase process, and they have shared their idea and this idea is only uh, will only be applied for new customers, not for existing customers, right? So I think that is also important to understand. So uh, and it might come if, into effect in whatever form in summer, Carl. So therefore, uh, as as you know, we just went ahead with with our price increase, and this is in contract price increases, and um, how. To what opinion Ofcom finally gets, we don't know yet. And yes, we have also noted uh, um, BT's uh, thoughts, how to deal with it in the future. And uh, we will take everything into account and um, uh, make up our mind what we will be doing uh, um, going forward. Um, but nothing to, to, be, to get revealed yet. Um, customer service, um, I mean, Definitely an area where we have to get better, no doubt about that. 
um, customer is not interested, that we have integrated a lot of our systems and stuff, um, but uh, we have improved significantly. We will be improving our customer service, so it's top of our agenda. Actually, we are investing a lot of money uh, into systems and into also care resources in 24, which is part of our OPEX increase. Um, so therefore, we are not considering the impact of customer service in our pricing strategy going forward. Hope that helps. That's great. Thank you. I much. think it's also worth pointing out that the the complaint numbers are to Ofcom are you know important to us and we we take it seriously, but quite small. You know, I mean, the broadband complaints, for example, represent point. 0.03% of our customers, 0.03% of our customers have filed a complaint with Ofcom. So it, it, that, that information doesn't generally find it into, into the press releases or the news stories. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't take it seriously. We do, and Lutz is correct. He's all over it, but it's a relatively small number. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Ulrich Wraith with Societe Generale. Your line is now open. Oh yeah, thank you very much. Um, so on the five initiatives that you highlighted for sort of crystallizing value, obviously the all three media divestment and the sunrise spin are the most tangible ones and they make perfect sense, if I may say so. But the um, UK, Netco and the Benelux whole co-creation, they, they're just, internal rejigging, right? So so any value creation, tangible value creation would, would come from the optionalities that arise from these moves. So so what I'm wondering about is, is what what you have in mind there? Is this now a stream of, of corporate action um, that's unfolding or is there going to be a bit of a pause um, you know, into next year or even the year after before we see more moves? Um, I'd just like to sort of um, see what, what your views are. And um, if I may just sneak in one, please, um, if it's too cheeky, um, uh, refer it to IR. But, but in the 10K, there is a statement that says the p and &E additions in 2024 would be broadly stable. That seems a bit difficult to construct with the divisional guidance, especially because Telenet CapEx is, is due to step up quite a bit. Uh, how, how do I, what, what goes down when, when Telenet goes up and, and the group p and &E consolidated would be, remain stable? Thank you. Yeah, I'll let Charlie uh, or Rick and Michael work on the second question. Um, on the first question, listen, it, it's the beginning. It's, it's certainly uh, going to take time for all of these things to be implemented. Don't, don't, you know, don't confuse that. I mean, Sunrise is clear. We are moving this direction. It is happening. We will advance the, you know, the transaction as rapidly as we can within reason, and, and uh, shareholders will have two shares of stock before the year's out. That's for sure. Uh, and that we think will be a big moment for our stock, given where we think the value of that dividend will, will end up, and given the fact that we're investing into Sunrise to delever uh, in advance of that. So that's a big moment along with the buyback. So to me, those things are tangible. You can bank on them, and they should have real value to, to shareholders, along, of course, with all three. In the U.K., in my opinion, opens up a lot of optionality, not just in terms of consolidation, in terms of financing, um, but I think it sends a message and a signal to the market that we are serious, that um, you know, this is going to be uh, a big strategic reorientation of our investment focus in the marketplace. And I think you'll see things happen throughout the year based on that uh, announcement. And you know, it will take time to implement. It doesn't happen overnight. It'll take time to implement. But I think that's the direction we're going, and I see lots of positive things following uh, from that even before we actually, um, you know, go through a functional separation of the businesses. So that's, I think, you know, watch that space. In Benelux, we'll see. I mean, you know, I think this is step one, just occurred. Uh, I think it, it, you know, I think people, other certain investors might see it as an interesting uh, platform to be part of. I think we'll, we'll, make decisions, we'll make some announcements around management structure during the year. Uh, who knows? Maybe we'll have things to d discuss with Vodafone. So I do think each of these announcements, you know, we're only in February here. Each of these announcements will be things we talk about through the course of this year. Um, and so I would, uh, you know, uh, be prepared. Uh, 
I think just on the CapEx Operator? side, sorry, I'm just going to jump in here. Oh, I think, yeah, go ahead, Charlie. Sorry. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. I was going to say on the Cap. So I was going to say, look, I think it's something we just take it offline, but I don't think we're giving formal guidance for 25 and 26 on, on CapEx. Clearly things change and move along. But I think the point was is that we believe we are at a reasonably elevated point in the CapEx cycle based on what we know today. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are heavily investing, I might make this point, you know, in 5G and in fiber, particularly actually in the UK, uh, but also across our footprint. So I think that was the point of the disclosure. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Georgios Iridirakino with Citigroup. Your line is now open. Yes, uh, good afternoon and thank you for taking my question. Um, maybe in two parts, please, around the UK net call separation. Firstly, I'm curious as to why the UK and not uh, Belgium, given that there's a much higher penetration, already a wholesale business, much more expensive rollout that requires more funding that you consolidate. Uh, curious why not that for the time being and just the UK. And secondly, just understand the rationale around the financing options in the UK. Is it fair to assume uh, higher leverage at Netco, where the process of that can be used to strengthen the self co balance sheet, or whether it's just a vehicle mostly for acquisitions and investment, and therefore not a dramatic difference in terms of the leverage ratios of what's left of remit? Thank you. Yeah, on the first question, we have created a netco in Belgium. Perhaps you meant the Netherlands. In Belgium, we have a netco. It's called Wire. It's already working on building out 80% of the country. It has 60% utilization and significant EBITDA. So we are well underway, even farther along, uh, fully, fully, you know, and functionally, and legally separated out in the Belgian market. So there we are, well underway, um, and you know that's sort of the model some extent, a similar model that we're trying to pursue in the UK. Um, I mean, did, did you mean Belgium or did you mean Holland? No, no, I meant Belgium, but I meant more the next step of monetizing and deconsolidating the CAPEX that Telenet isn't carrying uh, to wire. Sure. Well, we're not, we haven't announced that in either UK or Belgium, and we may do that in Belgium. It's too soon uh, to know, you know, how we'll approach that. Uh, what was your second question? Or maybe, Charlie, you caught that. Yeah, it was financing. Um, well, first of all, I think we'll be the same structure as we used with WIRE, that for NECO is a subsidiary of uh, Virgin Media Road 2, and I think it's a good news story for the bondholders because to the extent to which additional equity uh, comes into that business, that body equity, that obviously enhances the value of their debt stack. Um, there are no plans at this stage to you know, refinance the entire Virgin Media debt stack so that we would... Um, end up with you know, two separate capital structures. That may come over time, let's see, but it's certainly not the right time now with the uh, credit markets. You know, we've got some very cheap debt in Virgin, so now is not the time to, to give that up. Uh, but I do think long-term, you're probably right, that uh, a Servco probably has lower leverage than a Netco. I think Netco's predictability, asset backing, lends itself to higher leverage. And certainly as we pursue not just these infrastructure initiatives, but other infrastructure initiatives like our dental center initiatives, I think you should expect to see you know, us use leverage as we always do, is try and optimize returns for shareholders. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Matthew Harrigan with the Benchmark Company. Your line is now open. Uh, thank you. Uh, two uh, wonky uh, valuation points, if you would. One thing that's interesting with Switzerland that I know you, you and Charlie have spoken about just the general, you know, credit and equity market conditions, you know, the government bond rates. You look at the PE, you're, you're in the low 20s or just low teens in, in the uh, UK. So you've got a really favorable, just kind of generic valuation, you know, headwind. And, and if you strip out, you know, Switzerland at a decent price, I mean, obviously the other assets are going to look even more compelling in terms of the underlying multiple. But what, what sort of benign, you know, tailwind do you think? Just by giving people, you know, another, you know, Swiss telecom, you know, pure play, and then secondly, when you look at your capital structure, to your credit, I mean, you've got, you know, five-year bond duration, uh, three handle on the fully swap borrowing costs. It's, it's remarkable. But we just had another, you know, hot inflation number a few minutes ago. 
is your attitude toward leverage over the next five years really going to change if we're in this persistent, you know, somewhat higher rate environment? Because surely if you refinanced everything, you'd be materially higher in your, on your debt costs. Uh, thanks. And congratulations on the transaction. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Look at uh, Charlie can uh, work up an answer to the capital structure and leverage point um, on the valuation. Listen, it, it's our view that uh, this announcement should create a tailwind for sure, uh, because this will be, you know, a transaction that occurs in 24 at a, we think, uh, uh, you know, a sizable dividend to investors and, a, and, a, and something that they will. It's certainly not valued in our stock today. No question about it. So, and the tailwind it should create is, it, it, you know, it, I think it, 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 it is the first example of a pivot in our approach to distributing value. And it could be followed up by many similar type structures or transactions. And, uh, you know, you have to start somewhere. And I think we're starting in the right place with the right, bit, with the right asset at the right time. And, you know, I think what's most important for people to understand about these announcements today is what it means about the broader strategic roadmap we're pursuing. Uh, and that how you know, the lens that we're putting on value creation and value distribution going forward is slightly different. And, um, you know, we'll keep you posted as things start to develop. But I think, yes, I think that should create a tailwind if people are looking at it correctly. I appreciate that there's some frustration about, uh, you know, our guidance in one particular market. And, you know, we'll, we'll address that. Seems to me short-sighted to be focused on that. But nonetheless, we'll address it. I think the bigger message here today is, is the way we're going to create value for you. You know, Matt, on the leverage side, um, you know, we've been around a lot of time together, you and I, but it's four to five times leverage um, through the cycle. It's been pretty successful for us. Uh, and rates were a lot higher for much of that period. So, you know, I think that, you know, we obviously recognize that we've been benefiting in the last five, ten years from some very low rates. Uh, but I do also think that, you know, these businesses have proven to be able to drive an optimal cost of, ca ca of capital, um, even with higher interest rates. And I think the question of whether we'd be at the bottom end or the top end of that range, we'll have to make a decision when we come off these fixed rate deals. And just to remind you, I mean, that is a decision that's coming up, you know, the back end of the decade. Because, you know, most of our average life of debt, as you rightly point out, you know, is going to come off fixed rates 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. And what's we'll the view? I think we'll see at that point, you know, whether we think it's more prudent to be the lower end of the range, higher end of the range, it'll depend on the underlying growth of the assets. I mean, by then we'll be through the investment cycle particularly on 5G and, and most of the fiber builds, uh, we'll be in a position where we will hopefully have, you know, much more rational markets. I, I just think that it's too early to call it out. But you're 100% right. If we had to refinance our capital structures today, the underlying base rates we have locked in are significantly lower than the market rates. But let's see where rates are back into the decade, and we can make some judgments on where we would be in that four to five range. And you would probably what we do know is inherent valuation halo and a Swiss asset. Sorry, I didn't hear that. No, I'm sorry. You would probably agree that there's a material valuation halo, you know, multiple wise on, on a Swiss asset. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, the free cash flow. Listen, I mean, clearly, the free cash flow yields in Switzerland for distributed list, list, listed stocks, all things being equal, are lower than for euro or pound stocks and the reason is of course of the low cost of debt uh, low cost of capital if you like in in switzerland swiss government bonds are amongst the cheapest in in europe so you know clearly this spin is going to unlock that part of the uh, conglomerate discount uh, and i think that uh, you know it's obviously a very attractive market for other reasons so i think um i'm personally going to hold all my shares so uh, i'm very excited about seeing how andre and team progress over the next few years beautiful thanks charlie Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Polo Tang with UBS. Your line is now open. Um, hi, thanks very much for the uh, presentation. Uh, just two very quick questions. Uh, the first one is on UK cable ARPU. It was near stable in Q4, but how should we think about the trajectory of UK cable ARPU going forward? So are there still legacy voice and video declines, as well as maybe backbook repricing in the UK, or are you through a lot of these headwinds? And the second question is just on Switzerland. Uh, can you comment in terms of what you're seeing on competitive dynamics and specifically, what are you seeing in terms of promotional activity in Switzerland? Thanks. Sure. Uh, Lutz, let's get you involved. You want to uh, address the cable ARPU point? 
Yeah, Mr. sure. Um, so, yes. So, so I think, uh, as you might have seen it, the good news is that we have managed to stabilize the cable fixed RPU in the UK year over year uh, when you compare the number with Q4 uh, 22. And going forward, uh, unfortunately, right, there's still the cost of living crisis in UK. Um, there are still customers calling in for uh, uh, saving cost, uh, which leads to uh, uh, eliminating the landline or mid-tier pay TV products. On the other hand side, we are able to monetize speed and sell customers more. So, I mean, we are not giving an uh, uh, RPU guidance for 24, as you know, um, but I would say the macro hasn't changed, um, but uh, we take some positivity out of the uh, 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 stabilization of the fixed RPU out of uh, last quarter compared to a year ago. Hope that helps. Thanks. Andre, do you want to address the Swiss question? Yeah, sure. So um, I would say it's pretty stable, so no real acceleration or growth of, of promotions, I would say. We have seen, of course, lots of liquidity in Q4, which was driven by Black Friday, driving a lot of consumers onto the market again. We have been more active than in previous quarters just because we had the price rise behind us, and that actually paid off in the numbers that you saw in terms of uh, net ads in the quarter. And still we have some delayed activations only coming through in Q1, so we're quite happy with our return to the market, if you want, uh, in particular on, our, on, the, on the main brand. Uh, we have seen Swisscom not being um, 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 aggressive, really, with their main brand uh, in the Black Friday period. It's essentially, they have not uh, taken any promotions in that period of time. Um, so we think that the market uh, is actually trading quite constant compared to what we have seen previously. We also don't see a lot of more aggressive price points coming in. Um, so it feels like that the main brand, Flanker brand set up uh, and the promotional games in those two segments is pretty stable at this moment in time. And after the price rise, uh, we have come back being more active and taking our share in the market. And uh, I think that's a pretty good outcome for Q4 and Q1 is starting in the same way. Thanks. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of James Ratzer with New Street Research. Your line is now open. Yes, hello. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I have some questions on the sunrise part of the announcement today specifically. So Mike, you were saying at the beginning you'd kind of never seen as wide a discount between your asset values and the share price. So with that in mind, I was wondering why you decided, therefore, to push cash from the top co down into Sunrise and spin it out to shareholders rather than actually use it for share buyback, which presumably would actually create more value. And then on the Sunrise transaction itself, just from what's going to be left with Liberty Global, can you just run through what it's going to mean for your central costs? I think those have been 200 to $250 million outflow a year. What does that now come down to? And also your shareholder, um, comp or, sorry, your uh, share compensation costs, those that were running at about $230 million last year, I think in the 10K, as you become a smaller company with the spin-off of Sunrise, what happens to your share base compensation payments for the group? Thank you. Yeah, all good questions. Uh, I'll let Charlie work up an answer to the central cost point. Um, listen, on your first question, why would we invest the capital into Sunrise pre-spin versus uh, uh, increasing the buyback? Look, at I, I, I'm really uh, um, proud of what we've done in terms of buybacks. Owning 60% of this business has been the right move, especially given where we're going. And we don't, we continue to see buybacks as an important part of the strategy, but it's, it's, they're not mutually exclusive. It's not one or the other. And what buybacks do is obviously they shrink the equity, they, they demonstrate our commitment to the business, and over time they reduce the denominator to the point where 
uh, when these things occur, they occur at a greater uh, a multiple or greater of a greater valuation, and that's all well and good. Uh, but we also know that you know a, something like this, a spinoff of Sunrise, with you know an injection of cash, and which we are doing principally to maximize the fully distributed value of Sunrise, knowing that listing it is going to be difficult at its current leverage, and so we would reduce leverage. In essence, what we're doing is giving that money to investors, and saying you know if you whatever you think Sunrise is worth per share in our stock today, pick a number. You're going to have to increase that you know, by five bucks or, you know, whatever, whatever the number is, because we're essentially, you know, increasing the equity value of the business with this cash injection, $4.50 a share. And so at a minimum, there's a $4.50 share dividend, uh, tax efficient distribution happening, which I think many investors, maybe most investors, perhaps not analysts, but most investors will see as extremely positive. Uh, because buybacks take time to impact. They have they have to be followed up by events or moments where that denominator matters. So that's the answer to that question. On the share compensation, we'll see how it unfolds. I mean, you know, this transaction will happen second half of the year. We hope it does. Uh, there will be, a, you know, most of the uh, current employees who have shares in Liberty Global will end up with shares in Sunrise. And, you know, the comp committee will determine how best to manage that probably in 2025 and beyond. 2024, you know, I don't know that it's going to change anything because this transaction second half of the year, and, you know, it's hard to know what impact it will have. 2025 and beyond, we'll, we'll let the comp committee figure that out. Charlie, you want to talk about central costs? Yeah, sure. And as you already point out, yeah, we've been running at about 200 to, uh, to 250, much lower this time around. Uh, and we'll see how the, the years go on. That's a pretty uh, stable number. Just to remind you, there are, there are two additional central costs which are, I believe, assets. You know, one is our Liberty Tech, which Enrique has done an amazing job of creating, you know, market-leading connectivity and entertainment platforms that are very attractive. And you, you all heard about that Infosys transaction. I'd point out that it has a massive order book and is already, through Infosys, you know, exploring third-party opportunities. So one could argue that that is a potential unicorn. And we've also aggregated all our back office um, um, services um, and we've been we created a company which itself is also uh, profitable, uh, very attractive. We've actually had reverse inquiry about, about about buying it, you know. But essentially, the same principle: we have scale, we have best practice, we can invest, front load the investment in technology, and we think we provide a very very competitive product to our FMCs, and that's underpinned by some pretty long term contracts. So what you're really talking about is a central cost, which it broadly breaks down into three buckets. One is the cost of maintaining the current listing. Secondly, the cost of developing the next wave of growth, investing in things like uh, uh, Atlas Edge and what we hope to be very successful unicorns and potential trackers over, over time. And then thirdly, a series of uh, a real shared service, uh, high expertise at, uh, activities. Treasury would be a good example. Tax would be a good example. And I think one of the lessons that we learned from the Lilac spin uh, was that you know, we actually lost economies of scale. We lost expertise. Uh, and we should have preserved it. So we will be proposing uh, to continue to provide many of these specialist services on arms length agreements, but there'll be multi-year agreements, uh, probably broadly in line with what we use for internal transfer pricing purposes, a thing called GSA, which is often embedded deep in these indentures. So you should assume that with Sunrise, there will be a, a some you know, long-term contract for them to provide what we hope will be real value-added expertise. And I really do think it's value-added, and I think what Neil Marchand does as a treasurer will be very hard to you know, recreate on each of these opcos, and they're very happy to, to take those services. So I would say the 200 will come down over time uh, on a net basis, and uh, hopefully we're going to create the next wave of you know, multi-billion dollar companies from these, this ventures portfolio. So Charlie, does that mean given the size of Sunrise, of your consolidated operations there, I mean, can that 200 to 250 does that halve because of the GSA revenues you'll get from Sunrise? No, 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 it doesn't mean that. You know, remember that 200, 250 about, I mean, I don't want to give precise numbers, but as I said, there are three buckets, our public listing, the cost of um, developing these new ventures. But, you know, the proportion that is allocated to that, we will allocate as we see fit to, you know, over time to these four big companies. Remember, we'll still continue to uh, and Ireland, of course, we still continue to provide significant services to companies like BMO2 and the Benelux, you know, way beyond the spin of uh, Switzerland. But there'll be, some, there'll be some net income, and we'll disclose that at the right time uh, as the spin uh, documents unfold. Great. Thank you. Thank you. 
The next question comes from the line of Joshua Mills with BNP Paribas. Your line is now open. Hi there, and thanks for taking the question. Uh, mine was on the Virgin Media 2 guidance on slide 12. So in the press release, you did comment that there was some anticipation of B2D revenue weakness in 2024, which underpins the guidance for stable declining revenue. Uh, it would be great if you could just give a bit more color on that, given that you remain some positive on this basis in 2023. Is it contract losses? Is it something you're seeing on that side, or is it just a reflection of the macro situation? And then secondly, on the EBITDA guide, you know, for low to mid single digit declines, if I were to estimate that was around, say, 200 million of EBITDA, can you give us a bit of a breakdown, perhaps, on how much is being spent on IT efficiencies versus marketing expenses, just so we can build a picture for, or if you one off investments, which may be reversed in 2025 and beyond, and which of these higher investment levels are more structural? Thanks very much. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Luz, why don't you handle the B2B point straight away? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have done um, a lot of um, sales type lease deals. So meaning we are selling dark fiber or ethernet, uh, um, a lot of mobile backhauls or to link base stations uh, to uh, other mobile network operators. And the nature of these deals are that you can identify the revenue and the uh, EBITDA right away uh, at the beginning. Um, now, uh, we see at the moment less of these types of deals happening in 24, which is uh, a bigger driver for less revenue on the B2B side. Um, um, the, the other um, um, factor we take into account in our revenue guidance is still on the consumer side, the cost of living crisis. And um, the mobile handset market is materially down. Um, I think you've seen it also from competitors, so something in the region of 20% or more uh, year on year. So therefore, we are simply uh, uh, cautious uh, on that one. Um, do you want to answer the ABDA question, Mike? Or should I do this? Well, I mean, you can address that. I mean, we're not providing where in that range will be, whether it's low or mid. No, but, you know, no, I'm no, no. At the budget. no. I know where it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure how much detail we can provide. But, yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. The other point to make on the EBITDA yeah. the growth rate is quite a few one-offs in 2023. Those are also impacting the ability to generate a, a higher, you know, result on a percentage basis because of the – pretty big one-offs in the fourth quarter that are not a great comparable. Uh, so I don't know how much detail you want to provide, Lutz, but I think the question was, you know, we look at IT, you look at marketing, you look at um, yeah. things that we're doing in the year to drive growth, I, I mean, maybe provide a little color on that. I, I think for what, what I would provide without giving a number is, I mean, if you add, right, also uh, Next Fiber has announced a number today what they are uh, going to spend on network. Rollout. So that means, right, Next Fiber has 800,000 homes, um, right? It's easy to, to understand that the additional fiber homes will be more than a million. So um, if you think about what, what typical penetrations are from Virgin Media in these fiber, uh, new, new fiber homes, right, uh, uh, it's easy to understand that this already leads to material cost, yeah, in, uh, in EBDA, yeah? And uh, for that, you also need marketing and stuff. So uh, I don't give numbers. We don't give numbers. But I think this is a big driver. And it's therefore also uh, easy to understand that when we have these customers, that will, they will help us then with additional growth in 25. Yeah? And there are IT costs. Uh, and they're not immaterial. But um, I think um, the, the, the biggest uh, uh, part to mention is, uh, is the customer growth. Great, thank you. Thank you. I think we're at the bottom this of the hour the, here. We, yeah. Yes, this will conclude our QA session. So I will hand the call back to Mr. Mike Fries for closing remarks. Great. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Appreciate you staying on so long. I know it's been a, a busy morning, and 90 minutes is a big ask. So thank you for that.
slightly tough day to announce these results with uh, market conditions, but you know clearly um, there's a lot of anticipation for what we had to say, and maybe that's been part of the buildup. Uh, I, I, obviously, I sense, and we all sense, the disappointment in the VMO2 guidance. I will simply say, whether it's investment or one-offs, you know, this business will return to growth, and, and in our view, it's a blip, not a not a not a major issue whatsoever. And uh, we're excited about Lutz and, and what he and the team are doing, for sure. Uh, that our, our excitement hasn't changed one bit. And I also think the announcements we made today are, are substantial. You know, uh, the gap in our stock is real. Whether you think the FMCs are valued at two dollars. $5 or $6 are not valued at 30 We will show you with the spinoff of Switzerland what that business will be worth. That will be a big moment, and I'm confident that that will be a positive uh, event for investors. Um, and I think we have a pipeline of opportunities very, very similar to that. So shareholder remuneration is multi-pronged going forward. It's not simply buybacks. It's finding ways to put value in the hands of shareholders, uh, and that will be how we approach things going forward. Thank you for your continued support and patience. And uh, as always, you know where to find us if you have follow-up questions. Thanks, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes Liberty Global's full year 2023 results and strategic update investor call. As a reminder, a replay of the call will be available in the investor relations section of Liberty Global's website. There you can also find a co copy of today's presentation materials. You may now disconnect your lines.